So um, thank you, Robert, for being here today. It's You're welcome. And thank you for all of the work that you've done and that the center has done to make this possible. Uh, I, I didn't know how many uh, people uh, from the community at large, the community of psychologists and uh, philosophers and others would be here, but I'm happy that there are at least um, several, of, several of you <coughs> um, so that I can continue with my introduction as planned. And uh, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, if we're going to talk about um, the impersonal existentialists of the Sufi way, uh, the Sufi way, for the few of you who, who don't know about this here, uh, is, is the mystical dimension of Islam. And most Sufis uh, in the world by far, almost all Sufis, are Muslims. Uh, there are many other people who, who are comfortable in the Sufi tradition and who benefit from the Sufi tradition, from, and they could be from other faiths. This would be the, the, maybe the liberal view that I have and that many others have about the Sufi way. Um, but but uh, most of us are followers uh, of um, that religion and spirituality that uh, was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as we always say after his name. And, um, and yet, um, since that is the case, it's at least important that we distinguish between what a Sufi Muslim might um, believe and experience about the world and how we could distinguish that from um, the vast majority of Muslim believers. And um, one thing that comes to mind, so I wanted to open on this theme so that we, we understand uh, in today's presentation, we're going to be moving between existential language, psychological language, and religious language. And it's for that reason that we need to understand in what manner the Sufis are using religious language. So I have two citations that are, that are brief. Um, and the first one is about one of the earliest um, famous Sufi writers from Afghanistan, um, Hakim Sanayi. And um, Rumi quotes him uh, fairly frequently, both in the Masnavi and in his quatrains. We'll see references to his teachings. And here, what he has to say, uh, he's called the sage of Ghazna. And, and uh, Ghazni was um, a capital of uh, culture and great learning um, that existed in Afghanistan about a thousand years ago. And um, people were in that court uh, who, like Al-Biruni and others, who were geniuses and translators of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, and who were very open-minded so this is, uh, the Sufis often create um, uh, microclimates of enlightened culture, and they may be surrounded by um, uh, narrower views. Not infrequently, it would be the court itself where we would see this kind of culture. So here he says, the sage of Ghazna spoke with insight about those who were veiled from the truth. If they only grasp the Quran's literal sense, it's no surprise. They've gone the wrong way. From the resplendent 
rays of the sun, the blind eye only senses the heat. So this is interesting. Because he's identifying those who are veiled from the truth, not with people from other faiths. He's identifying them with the majority of the people around him. And he's saying that most of them are veiled and they lack insight. And because they've lost their way, they can only relate to the Quran in its literal sense. And this last line, from the resplendent rays of the sun, the blind eye only senses the heat. And we can try to imagine that for a minute huh, when our own eyes are closed and we're sitting under the sun and how wonderful that feels. It's not that there's anything wrong with sensing the heat of the sun, but to, to realize that the ultimate purpose of the eye is, is something different, something um, uh, something far greater, which is called sight. And, and so what he's laying out for us is, is a very common understanding in the Sufi way, um, which is that there's a huge difference between conviction and perception. And that conviction is a dangerous path and that the only way one could escape blind conviction is through perception. Perception, inner perception, inner awareness. So right from the outset, we should remember this as um, citations come up today that we would call religious, They're from the, the Islamic religious tradition. I'm a Muslim, um, many, many of the the even Western Sufis are Muslims. They don't. They they are not all Muslims. It doesn't matter to us, because as I as 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 Rumi has just explained in the citation, uh, and as we'll see, um, the real Muslim would be the person who actualizes Islam. Even though we overtly claim to be of the Muslim faith and we say the prayers, and we do these, these acts of worship that are particular to the faith of Islam. Now the second citation that is very famous, although I must say I'm, I only have my translation of this famous uh, uh, poem, again by Rumi, this is from the Quatrains, because again we have to ask ourselves that even though he, he delivers sermons, and even though those sermons could be taken literally. Nevertheless, who is it that would say the following thing? Outside of faith and denial is a vast plain in whose expanse abides our deepest yearning. Reaching there, the Gnostic rests his head where there's no faith nor denial in no place. So this is a famous um, poem, and it's um, not surprisingly, it is controversial. And so let us, let us understand that uh, the Sufis who wrote things like this, they had to have, even though they might have been protected by the court or, or by their followers, they, they were persecuted and executed from time to time for challenging the literalism. And remember, the, the Sufis were, um, on the other hand, extremely literal, because they realized the only way to work with literalism was to, to know the language even better than the religious literalists. So what they did is they studied carefully the root meanings of all the words. And, they, and, and so they actually uh, became more literalist from that point of view than the literalists. So uh, having said that, when, as we encounter religious language in this talk, um, uh, those of you who 
who aren't used to that. Uh, um, please, please remember uh, what, what Rumi has said. And we're starting out um, a lot with Rumi. And so the, the, with regard to this idea of the impersonal existentialist, uh, what, what is that supposed to mean, you see? Well, we assume that uh, on some level, the practitioner is using an existentialist language, which they are, as we'll see. They may also be using a religious language and other kinds of language, the language of love, for example. But there's a very well-established school of existentialism in Islam coming down very much from uh, Plato, Aristotle, other Greek thinkers, and um, reaching us through, uh, in Islam, largely through uh, Al-Farabi, Al-Farabias, huh? the Westerners, who said that uh, God, God's existence is his essence. God's essence is his existence. However, for the creatures, they have essence, but they do not have existence except from God. So obviously here we will see certainly a, a distinction from much of Western existentialism. But as you'll see, as we go along in the talk, there's not such a disparity as one might first think. But at the outset, let's just realize that this teaching comes down. And it comes down easily in Islam and in Islamic culture because there are statements in the Quran that, that are mysterious and that require some um, contemplation about the nature of existence and non-existence. Um, so when, when God says, um, um, when we want a thing, we only have to say to it, be, and it is. As you can see in that sentence, it poses quite a, a paradox. When we want a thing, we only need to say to it, be, and it, it, and it is or it becomes, it comes into being. And so naturally they're thinking, well, well, who is God speaking to then? Something that is not yet in existence and comes into existence. And so you could see why the teachings of um, Neoplatonism and other schools would have, would have been of interest to the early Muslims. 